Good morning. So I'm going to talk about everything else, miscellaneous. Okay, here are my disclosures. So what I'll, what I'll do is start with uh, thiopurines, talk about some of the adverse events there, specifically um, hepatotoxicity, uh, methotrexate, calcineurin inhibitors, and then we'll talk about some of the miscellaneous side effects of our biologics that weren't covered by the other speakers. So when you look at the latest Cochrane meta-analysis of the thiopurines for Crohn's disease, you see um, a comparison of adverse events relative to placebo, to 5-ASA, and to infliximab. And you can see that the point estimate for adverse events, either uh, measured by study withdrawal due to an adverse event or a serious AE, is numerically higher. But in no case is it actually statistically significant. And, you know, again, this is the problem with clinical trials is generally they're powered for efficacy and not for safety, but you can see that there is a, a point estimate here. And when you actually did a, an absolute number of study withdrawals, it's about 10 percent in the clinical trial. So in other words, 10 percent of patients in clinical trials of azathioprine or 6-mercaptopurine are leaving the study early because of an adverse event. The problem is that in the real world, that rate is a lot higher. So it's not 10 percent. It's more like 20 to 30 percent. And I just took a smattering of studies that came out 10 years ago from five different locations, Olmsted County, New Zealand, Oxford, two places in the Netherlands, and you can see that the withdrawal rates in these real-world experiences were much, much higher than 10 percent. And a lot of that has to do with hypersensitivity reactions like rash or fever or uh, like flu-like symptoms, but uh, there are other issues as well. So uh, again, nausea, allergic reactions, pancreatitis, bone marrow depression, you need to monitor the CBC on a regular basis, and then hepatotoxicity. And before we get into that, I just want to back up and, you know, even though this is on Im immunomodulators and biologics, don't forget that 5-ASA agents have some rare but serious side effects. You've got interstitial nephritis, so you should be checking your creatinine at least once yearly in your patients on 5-ASA, and I would argue that you might even want to get a creatinine three months into therapy just to make sure you're not missing that. You see pancreatitis, and then you also see blood dyscrasias. You can see uh, low white counts, and for some reason that's more commonly seen with sulfasalazine than it is with mesalamine. And the rheumatologists, when they use sulfasalazine, they routinely check a CBD at least once every three months, so don't forget about that. There's also a drug interaction between 5-ASAs and azathioprine. So the 5-ASA uh, reversibly inhibits TPMT, and that will uh, bump up your 6-thioguanine nucleotide levels. And if you had, say, a person that was on a stable dose of azathioprine, and then you introduce a 5-ASA drug, you can actually cause mild transient leukopenia. So be aware of that potential interaction, because sometimes it's actually clinically relevant. And here's a, a, a figure from uh, the study that Bill Sanborn did with Phil Lowry uh, showing that you had patients that had stable doses of their thiopurine, then you introduce the 5-ASA, and you can see that uh, close to 50 percent of these patients were actually getting leukopenic de defined by a white count of less than 3.5 um, eight weeks into the study. So be aware of that interaction. There's also a transient drug interaction between anti-TNFs and thiopurines. Uh, it's not well described. There are only a few cases of this, but you'll actually see a transient bump up in the 6-thioguanine nucleotides with leukopenia. For some reason, it tends to normalize uh, two or three months into therapy. Uh, interestingly, there's a paper online early about the effect of adalimumab on thiopurine metabolites, and there didn't appear to be any effect over a 12-week uh, course. It's only 12 patients. So let's talk a little bit more about hepatotoxicity. Um, this is kind of a sketchy literature because everyone uses a different definition for what constitutes hepatotoxicity. In general, we're tar talking about the short-term dose-related hepatotoxicity where your transaminases go up. In a study from Iceland, it turned out that azathioprine was the third most common cause of drug-induced liver injury, 4% of all the cases in Iceland. It was actually tied with infliximab, more on that later, and the absolute risk of this was 1 in 133. In a Spanish uh, nationwide study, it was, again, about 4% of patients developed some type of hepatotoxicity. That was defined as only two times the upper limit of normal in the transaminases. And again, this is generally dose-related. So when you have your patient and they get the, 
bump up in the transaminases, what I typically do is I hold the azathioprine for a few weeks, recheck the LFTs, make sure they've normalized, and then potentially restart the azathioprine at a slightly lower dose. Now, there's a correlation between the methylated 6-thiopurine uh, 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 metabolites and hepatotoxicity, but remember, this is a sensitive measure and it's not specific. In other words, there are a lot more patients walking around with elevated 6-MMP levels than there are walking around with elevated transaminases. So the finding of an elevated 6-MMP level in the face of normal transaminases doesn't mean you necessarily have to uh, reduce the drug dose or, or stop the drug. Um, the other thing you can do, and I would only do this if you're you know, really vigilant and you feel comfortable, uh, for your patients who are shunning to methylated metabolites and getting hepatotoxicity, you can introduce a very low dose of allopurinol and then reduce the dose of the thiopurine by about 75%, and you can shift the uh, six thioguanine nucleotides up and the methylated metabolites down. And there are actually studies showing that um, if you, this is a busy slide, if you look at the, the lower right-hand corner, these, uh, this is a measure of disease activity, and after you've introduced allopurinol, you see that disease activity goes down, and then on the upper uh, right, you see uh, prednisone dose going uh, down, and then transaminase is also going down uh, with the introduction of allopurinol. But again, I would urge you to really monitor uh, the white count carefully. And so there are actually now several studies showing that not only can you uh, prevent the hepatotoxicity, you can reduce some of the nausea, myalgia, and fatigue in some of these studies. But again, you really want to watch that white count, and you may want to get thiopurine metabolites periodically to adjust the dose properly. Now, there's a separate type of uh, th uh, hepatotoxicity with the thiopurines. This is a longer term. It's much more rare, but it's much more serious, and it can cause either nodular regenerative hyperplasia or venoocclusive disease. It's been estimated that the risk of NRH with azathioprine is about 1.2 percent at 10 years. Um, it, it's, it seems to occur more commonly in males and people that have had extensive small bowel resections, and one of the clues is thrombocytopenia. So if all of a sudden your patient is dropping their platelet count, you may want to get a, a, a Doppler ultrasound, look at their spleen, look at their pressures, look for any evidence of chronic liver disease, and have a low threshold for uh, discontinuing the thiopurine if you get any hint of that. The other point I want to make about the thiopurines is if your patient is only having nausea on azathioprine and no other side effects, they have a pretty good shot of tolerating 6-MP. And there are a couple of studies, I just showed a few examples here. You have basically a 50 to 60 percent chance of tolerating 6-MP if nausea was your only side effect with azathioprine. So don't forget that as an option in some of your patients. And then we're not going to get into this today, but generally these drugs are thought to be safe during pregnancy. This was one example from the Sazam study showing that women did have a, there was a higher rate of premature births and low birth weight babies, but congenital abnormalities were the same. And in general, it's more important to treat the underlying inflammatory bowel disease than to worry about the uh, potential side effects of azathioprine. So let's move on to methotrexate. This causes a variety of side effects, rash, alopecia. There are some GI side effects, which can often be mitigated with the use of folic acid. And if you're giving methotrexate as an injection, I would urge you to prescribe ondansetron for your patients to take 30 minutes before the injection, and you can reduce a lot of that anticipatory nausea that can occur. There's an issue with bone marrow suppression and also hepatic biochemical abnormality, so you should be checking a CBC and LFTs on a regular basis. In my practice, I do it monthly. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about hypersensitivity, uh, pneumonitis, and some of the hepatotoxicity. So th these patients can get a steat steatosis or steatohepatitis. Risk factors include obesity, the use of alcohol. You should probably limit your patients to no more than two alcoholic beverages a week while they're on methotrexate. Uh, diabetes mellitus would also be a risk factor for hepatotoxicity. Uh, you should screen your patients for uh, chronic viral hepatitis before you start methotrexate, and then monitor the LFTs on a regular basis. Again, I do this monthly, and then I adjust the dose of the methotrexate depending on the LFTs. And if you do that and take a more proactive approach, 
that whole literature in the psoriasis literature about doing a liver biopsy at 1.5 grams. I think nobody really does that anymore. And, and as long as the LFTs are, are satisfactory, I think you're probably okay. The, the overall risk of hepatotoxicity is low. It's been estimated recently in a systematic review to be 0 0.9 to 1.4 per 100 person months of drug exposure. Don't forget about pneumonitis with methotrexate. You can often get burned with this. It can present in a number of different forms. Uh, sometimes it presents acutely as a hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and they present with fever and a culture-negative pneumonia. But many of these uh, cases are subacute, and the patient might just present with dyspnea or a dry cough. And then on their uh, pulmonary function test, they'll have uh, restrictive pattern, maybe a decreased diffusing capacity. Uh, sometimes you need to uh, get the pulmonologist involved, do a bronchoalveolar lavage or a, even a lung biopsy. And obviously, if you're even remotely suspicious of this, you should hold the methotrexate until you can sort all these things out. And sometimes corticosteroids are used to treat the pulmonary toxicity. Uh, this slide is just to remind us that we should be doing some form of blood monitoring in our patients on these drugs. Um, the guidelines are sort of all over the map. In my own practice for thiopurines, I'm generally checking a CBC monthly the first year, and then if the, 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 there hasn't been any issues with leukopenia, I generally check it once every three months thereafter. Um, LFTs, you should probably be checking every three months. Methotrexate, you should be checking the same thing routinely. I, I do it monthly in my practice. Anti-TNF, I don't think uh, most societies in the U.S. recommend any type, right, uh, form of regular blood monitoring for that, but uh, some, the British Society of Rheumatology would recommend that you do so. Uh, let's move on to calcineurin inhibitors, cyclosporin and uh, tacrolimus. I think the biggest issue here is nephrotoxicity. You should be monitoring creatinine on a regular basis. Fortunately, this is usually reversible, uh, but occasionally can be progressive. Uh, these patients often develop hypertension, so they may require a calcium channel blocker. And then there is a neurotoxicity issue. They can get a fine resting tremor, and rarely they'll get seizures, and this is more likely to happen if they have uh, very low lipid levels. Um, while patients are on these drugs, you should be monitoring on a regular basis their potassium levels, magnesium levels, their creatinine, and uh, potentially their glucose, because they can get some hyperglycemia with this. So let's move on to anti-TNF therapies. We'll talk about neurologic, cardiac, hepatic, rheumatologic, and infusion reactions. So demyelination uh, can occur with these uh, drugs. Now this is confusing because we know there is a weak association between IBD and demyelinating diseases like MS and optic neuritis. This has been studied in multiple venues in Olmsted County up in Manitoba, the GPRD, and there seems to be a link that 50% to three times more MS is seen in the IBD population than the general population. There was a study of an old anti-TNF drug called Lenercept, specifically in MS patients, and there were actually more MS exacerbations in those patients. And so uh, basically, MS or optic neuritis is a contraindication to anti-TNF therapy. And if you go through the FDA database, there have been over 150 cases of demyelination reported. Uh, in a Spanish registry, the uh, incidence of this was 0 0.2 per 1,000 person years for infliximab and 1 per 1,000 person years for adalimumab. And just to have a number in my head for these kinds of things, I usually think of this as a 1 in 1,000 type side effect, just to, uh, when you're talking to patients if it comes up. This may be something that you'll want to talk to them about. There are other neurologic side effects reported with these drugs, Guillain-Barre, peripheral neuropathy, aseptic meningitis or encephalitis, leukoencephalopathy, transverse myelitis, uh, CIDP. Uh, PML has been described in patients on anti-TNF, so you don't need natalizumab to do this. You can do this with an anti-TNF drug. And then something called posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, which has also been uh, described with uh, eustachinumab. Uh, so don't forget about cardiac side effects with anti-TNF therapy. Um, there were trials of anti-TNFs for the treatment of congestive heart failure that were negative in the case of inotanercept, and in the case of infliximab, they actually saw a higher mortality rate in patients on high-dose infliximab. 
It's been estimated with adalimumab in their, in their safety registries uh, globally that CHF occurs 0.26 cases per 1,000 person years. So in a person that has congestive heart failure or you suspect a reduced uh, ejection fraction, you should probably work these patients up, get an echocardiogram, maybe get a cardiology consult uh, before you introduce this. Now, if the patient has a good ejection fraction and has just coronary artery disease, I don't think that's a contraindication, but the key is to know what the ejection fraction is, and if it's subnormal, uh, then you really want to think twice before uh, using that drug. Hepatotoxicity, fortunately, is fairly rare. It seems to occur more commonly with infliximab than the other anti-TNFs. If you read the prescribing information, there is a warning. Uh, that it seems to occur more commonly as transaminases, but it can occur with an increased L um, alkaline phosphatase. And that it often has autoimmune hepatitis characteristics, so you can actually check the autoantibodies, and they'll have positive anti-smooth muscle antibodies and the like. Generally, it will slowly improve after you remove the drug, and there are only rare cases, fortunately, of liver transplant or hepatic failure. But it's something that should be in the back of your mind with, uh, with these drugs. Lupus-like reactions can occur more, more so in women. Uh, these people usually present with arthritis or arthralgias. They'll have a rash or serositis. They'll be ANA positive. They'll all, often be double-stranded DNA positive, but don't forget sometimes they're negative on those, and they're positive for the antihistone antibody. So when you're working a patient up where you suspect lupus, don't forget to check the antihistone antibody. Um, the, the treatment of this is basically stopping the anti-TNF. Sometimes steroids are needed, and sometimes hydroxychloroquine will be prescribed by the uh, rheumatologist. Um, in contrast to skin reactions like psoriasis, recurrence of lupus with the second anti-TNF in what little data is out there, what little literature is out there, is actually fairly low. Um, so you can potentially introduce a second anti-TNF in these patients. So one study from University of Chicago, the highest estimate I saw of drug-induced lupus with anti-TNF was from U of C, and they estimated five-year incidence of 10% in women on anti-TNF therapy. So keep that in the back of your mind. Infusion reactions, we tend to divide into acute and delayed. The acute infusion reactions seem to be associated with antibodies to infliximab. Uh, the milder reactions are treated with acetaminophen and diphenhydramine and slowing down the infusion rate, but the severe reactions will require steroids or epinephrine. Uh, the delayed reactions are not necessarily associated with antibodies, and they occur one to five days after the infusion. Arthralgias sometimes require steroids if the arthralgias are not going away. And uh, this is more common in patients that are on episodic uh, monotherapy. Natalizumab, besides PML, what do you have to worry about? Headache is a commonly reported side effect. There are infusion reactions. They're generally mild. And there are rare cases of hepatotoxicity, and this can sometimes be severe and cholestatic. So, to wrap things up, a lot of different side effects uh, can occur. You need to be aware of these potential side effects when you're counseling your patients and evaluating them, and regular monitoring is necessary for many of these agents. Thank you.